My name is Corinna Hawkes, I'm Director of the Centre for Food Policy and it's fantastic to see you here this evening for our Women Food Thinkers talk, which are, the series, of the whole year is on women redesigning food systems. And uh, we had a great talk last week, in fact I think you are in the room, aren't you? Uh, thank you very much for the great talk that we had last month. Uh, sorry, on, on uh, food supply chains from, from Lisa Jacks. It's now online if you, want to, if you want to see it. And the purpose of this series is really to um, really kind of put some, I want to say meat on the bones, but it's not a great, uh, great analogy, of what are the processes in systems and in policy of how we're actually going to change food systems. In, in specific ways. And there's lots and lots of different ways of interpreting this. It can mean understanding um, lived experience of food poverty, which will be one of our uh, food thinkers, I think. Um, no, she's not here. Um, and it could be about supply chains, which is about what our talk, uh, Lisa Jack spoke about last month. Um, or it can be about how you react to particular events that the fit when the food system is under a type of shock. And that's what we're going to be hearing about today. What are the implications of Brexit from an international trade perspective uh, for <coughs> food, uh, what it costs, how available it is um, in the United Kingdom? Uh, these kinds of profoundly important policy events are very important for food systems and we need to understand how policy needs to play a role in reacting to that. So to talk to us about the effect of Brexit on food, I'm delighted to welcome um, Professor Fiona Smith from the University of Leeds, who is an expert on international trade law. Uh, she's in the, um, she's a, a lawyer, I guess, and um, is an advisor to the House of Lords on Brexit and agriculture. She's an advisor to the Welsh Government, to the UK Government on these issues, and has written widely on the issue of international trade law, particularly as it relates to agriculture and particularly as it relates to the World Trade Organization. So it's fantastic to have you um, here with us. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, I would, if you are, I would encourage you to listen uh, so that you can reflect and engage in some questions afterwards. I'm sure that many of you have questions. However, as you are listening, um, if you do have time to tweet, feel free to do so. Uh, and I think there's some um, uh, hashtags around on the walls and some, and some Wi-Fi codes um, as well. So uh, do feel free to, to, to do so. Okay, so with no further ado, I'd uh, invite you, Fiona, to your, to your talk. So, um, thank you, Corinna, uh, for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's lovely to be back here again in London. Uh, I used to work here a little while ago now, uh, so to be back in such a wonderful city and away from uh, flood ridden uh, York. Um, I also want to thank for the invitation to um, be part of this Women Redesigning Food Systems. And it's given me an opportunity to really think about the women that have influenced me uh, in my career. And I want to give thanks to them at the start of my talk, um, because it is with the help of other women that um, I've been able to succeed. Uh, and certainly, that's not to denigrate my male colleagues who have equally been spectacular, but certainly it's important for to pay tribute uh, to the women. And I'll say a little bit more about who particularly has influenced me um, at the end um, of the talk. So the UK left the EU, finally, on the 31st of January this year at 11 o'clock UK time. That's midnight EU time. And following that event, we are now entering a period of profound change. <coughs> so we're going through profound political change, structural change, change in our culture, the way we've been living our lives, and also significant regulatory change. It's exciting. We can rethink all our policies and particularly we can rethink our policy 
on food. We can take the time to think about what a UK uh, food policy looks like and we can divide, devise policies that work for the devolved nations as well as England. But as we move forward and think about what that food policy looks like, we need to remember that we live in a globalised world. Our oranges come from Spain. Our asparagus, when it's not grown here in the very short growing season, comes from countries like Peru. And the tea and coffee that we drink comes from countries um, like Kenya and India. And not to mention all the inputs <coughs> into our food that we eat, <coughs> from the soy that goes into some of our processed foods and into our animal feed. That soy comes from the US and the EU as well as South America. So our food choices are globalised choices. Food production, as you've heard last month, doesn't take place um, within a very, very narrow range of you being very close to the producer. Sometimes that happens, but more often food arrives with you through a complex system of global value chains. So in the trade world, we think of this as trade and tasks dividing up the little bits of the food chain and um, moving the, the elements of the food around the world. And the final thing to note is that we live in a globalised regulatory world. The UK sits alongside regional <coughs> institutions like the EU and global institutions like the World Trade Organisation and each of these have their own roles, their own processes and essentially what we've got is a global institutionalised architecture governing um, the food that we can buy. It's inevitable that as the UK moves forward um, devising its policy, it has to take into account the globalised world within which we now live. So I wanted to take the opportunity this evening to reflect on um, that globalised world a little bit um, uh, more. I want to look at how food policy is changing in the UK and what the regulatory environment is, is looking like. And I want to look at particularly why trade is relevant. So how is trade relevant to that environment? And I think we'll, we'll see that it's relevant in quite uh, unusual and probably surprising ways. And then I want to uh, reflect on what the interaction of trade and food and food policy and trade policy mean uh, for the UK um, going uh, forward. So I thought it was important uh, to think about where we've come from first. So think about the food policy environment and the food regulatory environment uh, that we've been used to for the last 40 years up until January this year. So essentially, uh, we've been working within the EU's food policy objectives. So this is high quality, high food safety standards, high animal welfare, and with a preference, I think, a community preference. So this is preference for food grown within the EU. And the regulatory mechanisms that have been in place have basically tried to fulfill that policy objective. So we've had multi-level governance regulation of this food vision. We've got the UK Food Safety Act, uh, which came along in 1990, that's um, really looking at safety standards in food, and we know about our own food safety, um, food standards agency, which is looking at that. But we've also had a very, very comprehensive EU food law that's designed to safeguard human and animal health. It's been harmonising all our methods of production, all our animal welfare, it's based on the precautionary approach. So the EU would regulate on the risk, the possible risk of harm, rather than on um, the exact evidence that harm doesn't occur first. Um, the scientific risk assessment shows there may be harm and the EU regulates um, on that basis. So the domestic regulation, if we can call it that, within the EU, EU is within the food law framework. But the EU ensures the integrity of its food systems by also embedding food within its trade policy. So all the EU's trade agreements are um, based on 
the ability to ensure it maintains its high regulatory standards and it will not import foods that fall <coughs> below those standards. This means that many of its trade agreements don't have very large commitments on agriculture um, because countries are not prepared to agree uh, on those, those high, high um, standards, there's this disagreement. The other way that the EU protects its um, food systems is by what we call a tariff war. So essentially, as part of its trade policy, the EU has a very high, what we call common external tariff. So this is an import tax that sits around the outside of all the EU uh, member states. Every member state charges the same tax and they're set very high for agriculture. So the import tax on dairy is 54% of the value of the product imported. So if you imagine whatever the price is, crank it up by 54%, and it's 31% on products like sugar. The EU does have a series of trade agreements with 40, uh, 40 agreements with over 70 countries, and again, in every uh, trade agreement, as we say, food standards are protected. So we've got national, UK, we've got EU standards um, with the trade um, embedded in the EU. The EU negotiates trade agreements on behalf of all its members um, in line with uh, its institutional goals and the treaty. The other thing to remember is the EU also operates externally within the context of the WTO, the World Trade Organization. So the World Trade Organization uh, was nice and obscure until 2016, and then it became mainstream, so many of you have already heard about it, so I won't dwell on it too much. But essentially, it's a system of regulation governing trade in goods, services, and intellectual property. It has a dispute settlement mechanism for um, disputes that, are, that come up on, in relation to its trade agreements. And every WTO member, there's 164, Every WTO member has a list of import taxes that it commits to. So these are maximum import taxes, otherwise known as scheduled tariffs. It also has a list of the, if you like, the concessionary tariffs. So the amount of goods it will allow in at a lower tariff. Um, these are known as tariff rate quotas. So basically, once the volume of goods has come in at the lower tariff, the tariff for the, the rest of the goods have to be imported at the higher tariff. So the EU's got a series of these that it's committed to, um, to, to give as part of its WTO obligations. And it also has a list of commitments in relation to the amount of subsidies it gives to its farmers. So that's the regulatory environment that's controlled through the WTO agreement so that EU is not free to roam as it wishes, it's part of the WTO. So where are we going next? We've now left all of that. So we know that we've got this a new food policy um, being developed um, with it for England, but it will take into account um, the, the developed nations as well. Uh, it obviously doesn't speak to them, um, but it does uh, take their interests in account. We know that Henry Dimbleby is leading the um, food strategy. He was appointed in 2019, and he's looking to deliver a safe and healthy and affordable food system, um, regardless of where people live. It's got to be robust to shocks to the system, and it's got to restore the natural environment. And it has to be um, taking into account the important principles that uh, Corinna and her fellow experts in the Lancet Commission report, Food in the Anthropocene, set out. It has to look at the relationship between health, um, the affordable food, and protection of the environment. So it has to take into account <coughs> the climate emergency. So that's where the government's going in terms of its policy. Um, Henry Dimbleby is due to report in the summer and it, his report, I'm told, does have a trade chapter um, which is being fleshed out at the moment. Uh, so there certainly will be a trade element to it. So how is the government going about starting to implement this new uh, vision for food? Well, we've got the first pieces of legislation that are now starting to come out 
um, of um, Parliament. They were announced by uh, Theresa Villas uh, at the Ops of Farming Conference this year in January, and then shortly after, on the 16th of January, the Agricultural Bill was reintroduced back into the House of Commons, setting out this new vision. So in terms of agricultural production, so our food production, we're going to be moving away from money that's paid to farmers based on the area of land that they farm, and we're going to move instead to a system of payments to farmers for public money, for public goods. In other words, there's going to be a much closer link between the food we produce on the farm and protection of the environment. So uh, that includes soil quality, sustainable development, managing the land uh, in a sustainable uh, way. Uh, and it'd be good news for the citizens of York because it includes um, planting trees and trying to sort out um, the flood risks. We're also going to see protection, um, much more transparency in the food chain. So for the idea that farmers will not be as exploited as they were, um, uh, particularly by higher prices, <coughs> or a lack of transparency in the different elements of the, uh, the food chain. So, so that's in the agriculture bill. There's very little on trade in there. Um, there were a couple of calls to try and, and embed UK high animal welfare and good quality food uh, standards within the bill, but that hasn't happened. What's happened instead is the government has taken control of the, um, the volume of subsidies that can be uh, given to farmers that have to be compatible and how that compatibility squares with the WTO agreement on agriculture. So although agriculture is a devolved function, so Scotland, um, Northern Ireland and, and Wales have their own agricultural policy, in terms of the relationship between agriculture, food and trade, that, uh, that's been taken back to Westminster. So that bill is um, due to receive royal assent uh, any time soon. The second um, element of this impl implementation of this um, domestic vision for food is the environment bill. And it builds on a lot of the food production <coughs> elements uh, in the agriculture bill. But the specific food issues are that producers will take responsibility for food waste and for pushing it back into the con economy. So we will be creating <coughs> a circular economy. And the government's going to set more responsible uh, product standards, much, be much clearer on uh, information and labelling, and there's going to be an overall shift to sustainable um, food production. And the third element to that, if you like, um, as you will all no doubt already know, the climate change targets um, have now been embedded into law. So the UK has to reach net zero in terms of carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, and that's now in a, uh, as part of the Climate Change Act. Now the reason I'm setting this, this vision out is because it talks tangentially about trade, but it doesn't get into trade. So trade is not a devolved function, it's, it's uh, left with Westminster, and that means that we need to work out where the trade issues are going uh, to see how it aligns with what the government's started to do and intends to do. So why is trade relevant? Basically, it's relevant for a couple of reasons. Firstly, we are a net food importer. Our trade deficit is 24.3 billion pounds, so we import 46.8 billion pounds worth of food, feed and drink, and we only export 22.5 billion. That trade deficit is widening, not reducing. So it's increased by 40% between 2005 uh, and 2018, <coughs> which is the last statistics from DEFRA. Our main import markets are the Netherlands, so that's where the food mostly comes from, and the Irish Republic, some from France and Germany. And, one of, and those are our main export markets as well, coupled with uh, the US. Um, fresh fruit and veg are the, the thing that we import the most of. So that gives you a quite a, a, a sense of, of how important trade is, but in actual fact, 
It's more complicated uh, than that. I talked about supply chains before, and you've had a talk on them, so I won't um, say too much. But trade is really important to supply chains. So basically, um, these supply chains cross border. So we're thinking about devising a trade policy just for the UK, but these supply chains, they're crossing borders. So it's only certain elements of the supply chain that you see here that is going to be occurring in the UK. Even in terms of short supply chains, we like to think about the far our farmers' markets and our proximity to the, to the um, produce. The farmer could well have had bought, acquired his, his um, animal feed or his sugar beet seed outside the, um, outside the UK from the US and also from the EU. So even the shortest chain has a global uh, reach. And the other thing that is important to note is these supply chains are built on the back of existing trade agreements that open up trade and reduce restrictions on the free flow of goods. So we work within a just-in-time food system. So the food is literally flowing around the world um, at a very, very quick rate. So we get um, food very quickly. And the class, I'll leave you with the classic on food chains, uh, which you no doubt will have last time, in terms of the Northern Irish border and why it's important. So one in five cows in Ireland produces milk for Bailey's Irish cream. And if you're a Northern Irish cow, your milk crosses the border five times before it ends up in the bottle. So you can see the use that um, companies have been making of these chains. The other thing that statistics don't reveal is the problem of transshipment. So I said the Netherlands was one of our biggest importers. And the reason for that is because a lot of products come in from outside the EU into the Netherlands to the port of Rotterdam because it's so large, they're decanted down into smaller ships and then shipped out. So our statistics uh, are quite misleading as to exactly how food gets to us. Uh, we really do need uh, to keep an eye on that, as do the government. What's been worrying us? Well, there's four things that have been worrying us about trade and its relationship to food. One is about the, the loss of our livelihoods. So the EU mechanisms that we've had have certainly been designed to protect a, per, a particular livelihood, a particular look to the landscape, and a particular um, look in terms of um, our national identity uh, as you, you drive through uh, or take the train through the countryside. So will trade erode that the second thing we're worried about is affordability. When all these mechanisms for trade that we've had with the EU and the quality of the food that we've had with the EU, if those go, what will happen to food prices? Will they go up? Will they come down? The government <coughs> says they'll go down, but let's see. We'll, we'll look at that in, in a moment. And food deserts, will we get a rise in food deserts? Will there be more corner shops selling foods that are not of good quality? Um, will, what sort of food will we get in? And then the final one, uh, the iconic chlorine wash chicken. What will be um, the standard of risk and the type of food systems that we'll be required to take on if we enter into um, these um, agreements? So that's the landscape, that's the concerns, that's the, inter that's the interaction between sort of why we're worried about trade and, and how, how far the government's got and what our concerns are. So let's see how that's playing out in terms of the relationship between food policy, trade policy and food regulation and trade regulation. So this is where we are now. So we're in transition and we're going to be in transition from the 1st of February right through to the 31st of December this year, again 11 o'clock UK time. So during this period, we'll have the same sort of food policy um, that we've enjoyed. So the same sort of EU standards, welfare and environment requirements, and they'll be sitting within the same sort of trade environment within the EU that we've been used to, to having. So high tariff wall, big protective trade tariff barriers around the outside of the EU, um, high standards for goods coming into the EU, including now the UK, UK benefiting from um, some of the EU's trade deals. 
Uh, so that's what we're used to because we're in transition. But it's not quite business as usual. We're now an independent member of the WTO. Okay, so that's happening now. So we owe an obligation to comply with the WTO rules. Now, on our own, the EU is not going to be protecting us or fighting our battles. Anything that a, a, mem a WTO member can bring a case against us now. We are going to set and then negotiate our own tariffs. So it's obviously been controversial. It's in the news. I'll say a bit, little bit more about it um, in a while. The UK government has actually submitted what's called a tariff schedule, it's a list of tariffs, it has actually submitted one to the WTO already and it did that in December 2018. That list of tariffs basically replicates the EU's existing tariffs, this is exactly the same. The issue is, although numerically the tariff is the same, in reality, the tariff is not the same because the access to our market is a lot smaller than access to the EU's market. The EU is the second largest economy uh, in the world. Now, what that means is the WTO rules allow other WTO members to negotiate further access to the UK market if they believe, if they were a major supplier, and if they believe that their trade position has been compromised. And that's exactly what's happening at the moment. So the UK is in negotiation with its major agricultural suppliers to allow greater market access to our markets as a result of the schedule. So this is happening, but we don't see it in the press. Right? So there will be more goods coming in from specific countries. Okay? So we're not, we're not going to be able to, to stop that. The, so that's important. Um, one of the countries objecting, just to let you know, is the US. Um, just to let you know. Okay, so we... There we go. The other thing we have to do is we are obliged to take a share of the EU's... Um, uh, tariff quotas, in other words, that volume of products the EU allows in at a lower tariff, we have to take a share. That's a legally binding commitment from the EU that we now inherit. Now, the, the question is how, how does that happen? Because some countries will say, well, look, New Zealand was supplying a lot of lamb to the UK before, so why don't we just take their lamb? Well, New Zealand say, no, 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 not having that, not having that at all. Um, because we want to be able to supply into the EU, so we want bigger share because we've lost the opportunity to trade into the EU. So a lot of, lot of trading and negotiation happening behind the scenes. Again, these products are coming in. We won't be um, able to change that. So this consultation on tariffs that Michael Goves announced this week is a consultation on what we call applied tariffs. So these are the tariffs that are actually going to work in practice. These are WTO commitments. These are things we have to have and uh, access that we have to give, and then um, there'll be the rest that we, that we sort of are working to have. So just a couple of other things. So our food standards have got to comply with the WTO. Our food labelling must comply with the WTO to the extent that it affects um, goods coming in. Our animal welfare standards must comply with, with WTO rules. Previously, they would have been really tricky, but there's a lot more movement on those. So these, these are the agreements that apply to there. And also, we don't think about it, but we need to think about workers coming in and out. Because the commitments within the general agreement on tariffs and trade uh, are sort of negative list approach. So it may well be we don't just inherit the EU's um, uh, sort of services um, obligation, particularly in relation to transport, which is important. Um, to food. Um, WTO is, is now sitting within the border as, as well, so in terms of the farm support programmes that the UK is pushing forward, they have to be compatible with the WTO agreement on agriculture. There's a real question as to whether we can produce food in that way because of the mechanisms the UK government wants to use um, to do that. And finally, our trade disputes um, must be settled in accordance with WTO rules. The ethos 
that we're going into with the WTO is different to the ethos of the EU. We're used to thinking of the EU as a sort of imposing rules down on us, and then we get an opportunity to discuss them, but it's definitely imposed from on high, enforced within the, enforced within the national courts, and then uh, that's the way that our law changes. WTO doesn't work like that. It's a negotiated forum, and it's about power, and it's about the way that trade and economics works in practice. So we're in a different ethos, different policy environment, and a different regulatory environment. So this has become a lot more immediate. Previously, the EU would um, insulate us from that. So that's transition. What about all these trade agreements um, we hear about? So this is the government's vision for trade. Now, interestingly, um, Theresa Villas, in her speech in um, at the Oxford Farming Conference, it was quite clear that um, we would keep the same high standards for food uh, and that we, for our goods coming in, as that we expect of our farmers and our food producers domestically. And when pushed in questions, she said she was going to do that through tariffs. So she was going to stick high tariffs on the chlorine-washed chickens of this world and lower, um, and lower tariffs on um, other products that we like, and then she was also going to have a series of mechanisms through, through standards, embedding the standards in the trade agreements. So one thing that's um, very clear about that is that this is tricky. So the WTO um, is, going to, is going to have a problem with this approach because in terms of the tariffs, um, Tariffs attached to what we call tariff lines. Sorry, this is horribly technical. So it depends on whether there's a tariff line for chlorine washed chicken and a tariff line for fresh chicken. The historical approach um, by WTO is that they regulate the products and not the process by which the product circulates. So any attempt to regulate the product is an act of discrimination against the exporter of that product, and as such, that's a violation of WTO rules. If you put a tariff on and differential chlorine washed chicken is just a method of washing chicken, it's chicken, it's slightly yellow, but it's still chicken, then that's a differential on the product, probably a violation of WTO. There's been an attempt to have a different sort of tariff way of scheduling the tariff, but basically there's an issue there. And again, um, what we need to think about is those standards need to be WTO compatible. What about the EU-UK trading position then? Thinking about, so that's the sort of general position. What about the EU trading position? So essentially, what we have is a different vision for the relationship between the UK and the EU going forward. So in terms of the policy, we're not looking to keep the same high regulatory standards in relation to food that we had during the time with the EU. We're actually going to be devising our own policy standards, and there's a statement to this effect in the political declaration, which is the second document accompanying the EU withdrawal agreement that we had heard so much about. So there's going to be regulatory divergence. <coughs> now, the government says its, it's policy standards are going to be higher than the EU's, but, but the issue is uh, they are going to diverge. The other thing we know is there's going to be a free trade agreement the European Union is a customs union. So a customs union essentially has one tariff sitting outside. A free trade agreement is offers just preferential access to the parties to the agreement. So basically lower tariffs for the goods coming in from the other party. So each country can charge their own import tax um, on every other uh, country. The difficulty with that is that you then need to start thinking about um, rules of origin. You need to prove that your product is from the UK and uh, going into the EU. So you need to prove that it's a UK product, and to do that, you need a rule of origin. And essentially what these do is they just identify the product having so much content, UK or EU content. And again, the problem we've got is all these suppliers 
who've been working on the basis of being able to do bits of their food production and, and processing all over the EU. So actually getting that UK content is going to be very, very difficult. So trying to achieve this is going to be hard. So even to, to get the vision, it's going to be difficult. So they said we're going to have Boris Johnson announced on the 3rd of February that this is the, the creature he wants to create. So a very different change to what um, Theresa uh, May was, was looking at. So in terms of trade policy, we're looking at a much more open, liberalised trade. It'll knock down into food policy because it will open the market up for um, quite free-flowing um, goods. And it doesn't necessarily uh, say anything about standards. So I thought it'd be just helpful to say a little bit about what the EU-Canada deal actually does um, and say uh, what it is uh, we're expecting. So it certainly gets rid of import taxes on quite a lot of produce, so 98% um, of produce have lower import taxes, but a major area that doesn't have lower import taxes is agriculture. So agriculture is an exception to this lovely liberal um, regime. Canada was a rule taker in this negotiation. So the EU managed to secure protection of its wine and spirits going into Canada, so Canada is no longer able to call its uh, wine Chardonnay or wherever, um, if it's a protected designation of uh, origin. So the EU secured that. It managed to get Canada to drop all its tariffs on imports of, exports of chocolate from the EU. Um, the EU refused to take any chicken or eggs from Canada. So chicken and eggs are excluded. The reason they're excluded is because the, uh, Canada has a deal, trade deal, with the US and Mexico, and so chlorine washed chicken is happily zooming across the border there. So that's excluded uh, from the, that deal. So in actual fact, the, there are, the, the two of them have agreed um, to sort of, if you like, harmonised standard is probably a bit strong. They've agreed mutual recognition on certain products so that their standards are, the, are sort of the same. But it's not a free-for-all. So what has to happen is that um, the, each country, well, Canada really in, in this case, has to inform the EU that it's going to be importing certain products um, and then the EU will check uh, to see whether they're actually in conformity with its own standards and they'll agree on how many times the EU will actually check the imports of Canada uh, products coming in. So it doesn't just allow free checks, there will be um, checks at um, the border. The good thing is there is a trade and sustainable development chapter, um, uh, rules on trade and sustainable development, and there are rules on trade and the environment. So really trying to embed the climate change policies within um, this agreement and, and show that both uh, the EU and Canada are committed to um, sustainable development uh, and uh, protection of things like water um, and the use in food. So that's option number one. This is Boris Johnson's option number one. Boris Johnson's option number two is like the Australia deal. And as you'll see from my slide, there's no such thing as an Australia deal. Um, so there is no trade agreement. What there is is a framework partnership arrangement. So this is basically a framework of discussion. The only thing the EU and Australia have managed to agree on is uh, a wine. So recognition uh, of, of protection of wines. They've both got very large uh, wine markets. Um, there's some agreement on standards for uh, manufacturing, but nothing on agriculture. <coughs> Essentially, they started prop full um, trade agreements only in 2018, trade negotiations in 2018. Um, it's going to be a bit like the Canada deal, so in terms of structure, reduction of tariffs, recognition of the standards, a little bit on competition and environment, things like that. 
But what the EU has made very, very clear in its negotiations with Australia is it is essential that it protects its, quote, vulnerable sectors, the key of which is agriculture. So it's not going to be dropping its standards, dropping its tariffs of any kind. So this might be another vision, highly protected um, sector. Is this, what, um, is this what the Boris Johnson means by this? I think what he actually means is that they'll just have a framework and then everything will get negotiated. So he can claim that there's a deal at the end of the year, but there won't be one. Okay, so it's a very uncertain policy environment in terms of the relationship between the UK and the EU. Um, the EU will be pushing to retain its high standards. So in any negotiations, they'd be pushing to retain its high standards. But the UK is insisting in, on divergence. It's insisting on setting its own standards. It's going to make that agreement very, very difficult to negotiate. So it may well be that the UK ends up taking a lot of the... Um, EU standards depending on, on how this plays out. And what about trade with the rest of the world? So the government has this incredibly ambitious trade agenda and as you see it's, uh, it's aiming for global domination in terms of trade agreements. It's got priority partners uh, US, Japan, Australia and New Zealand um, all very different markets. Bizarrely, Japan is very, very heavily regulated, very protective of its agriculture and the quality of its agricultural produce. Uh, doesn't like to, is very keen on trying to balance uh, access to its markets. US is, uh, I'll say a little bit more in a minute, and Australia and New Zealand have very open trade, very low um, tariffs, a very, very different attitude to trade, um, particularly in agriculture um, and um, food. The UK has, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to say it how it is, a bizarre um, idea that it's going to join the comprehensive and pro progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is a trade, a very large trading arrangement that covers the countries on the Pacific Rim. So if you were to draw a sort of line, that's where they are. Now, normally you would, you would actually enter into a trade agreement with the country that's closest to you, not one that's halfway the other end of the planet. So you're swapping one regulatory framework, like the EU, for another um, over, um, over in that way. It's bizarre, but it's the first country to do anything that weird. Um, but, you know, hey, we live in strange times. Um, so let's think about the elephant in the room, the US-UK deal. Now what we do know is the UK, and the, the UK is planning to negotiate its EU-UK deal and its, its UK-US deal at the same time. I've said a lot about EU policy, about food and about trade. The US could not be more different it has a um, heavily uh, liberated market, uh, if you like. It works very, very differently. It works on a different perception of risk. It doesn't use the precautionary principle. It uses a lot of pathogen um, sort of treatments, wash, various washes in relation to its food um, on the grounds that uh, that's safe. Um, and so it's very much about end use for the consumer, whereas the EU has a farm-to-fork approach. So it's a very, very different regulatory environment for food. For trade, um, the US is a very liberal um, trading partner, or it was. It's now slightly different. Um, so we're talking about very, very different places. So these are the, these are the trade priorities that um, Liz Truss announced. Um, in February this year for the scope um, of the trade agreement. Now what you may not know is the UK and the US have been discussing this arrangement for much longer than this and they actually started in 2017 and the arrangement, they, they actually started talking under the auspices of what's called the Trade and Investment Working Group. And there's been a lot leaked, but in actual fact, there's a public hearing uh, document that you can access uh, free without violating any uh, security 
uh, issues, where the US Special Trade Representative heard, held a meeting. Sorry, yes, could we borrow a marker for the next door? Yes, help yourself. <laughs> if we've got one. Or have we? I don't know. I don't, oh, think, I don't think we do. Sorry. So okay. this is a, a public um, talk. It's not a lecture. So okay. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, we can't help you. Did you so get to edit that bit? Teacher, so <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> we have a lot of easy classes. Yeah, but I never have any pens. That's the thing. That's the, not even when I teach. It's terrible. Okay, so. Uh, so take a step back to, the, to what's actually available. So there's some leaked documents, I'm sure you saw Jeremy Corbyn uh, waved them um, last, last uh, year. Um, but there's actually this public hearing that was held by the US Special Trade Representative um, and as part of the Trade Policy uh, Staff Committee in, in January last year. And what's really interesting is the sort of, um, the, the sort of like to get to get a sense of what it is the U.S. should be negotiating in terms of um, the U.K.-U.S. deal. So essentially, this is what uh, we can expect. So they're looking at the complete elimination of U.K. tariffs on grapes, on cranberries, and also some of their chocolates. So they they drop to zero. So all the import um, taxes drop to zero. They're looking for a joint U.S. UK approach to food standards. So the idea is the UK and the US will develop food standards jointly and these will then be rolled out to other WTO members as a suggested way forward. Now the EU the <coughs> EU wants the UK to develop joint food standards with the EU in its trade agreement going forward. So you immediately got this, this thing going. So, so the US, yeah, this is what we want, joint standards. The other thing we know is that the US want the UK to abandon the precautionary principle. So this is regulate, regulating on, on the basis that there, there's, a, there's a, a possibility of harm. And one of the um, individuals giving evidence said what they wanted to do was get rid of the EU rigid and prescriptive food standards and move to more regulation that was sensible and that was aimed at public health and was not based on ill-founded fear about certain things, i.e. pouring washed chicken. So there's that's the public available document. And in the leaked documents um, about that were other working actual practices of this, this working group, this US um, UK working group, um, we can see even uh, more information. Uh, we're looking at voluntary standards on food, not mandated standards, less use of regulation. Um, so not at the moment it's mandated, you will have X amount of water in the chicken, you will have certain um, you know, food hygiene regulations, moving away from that and looking at voluntary standards. The Food and Drink Administration in the US is actually funded partly by company contributions, and those companies do steer the FDA in terms of which priority areas it should be looking at in terms of food health. So that's an approach the US are quite keen to bring over uh, into the UK, talked about the precautionary principle. They also want to get rid of health labelling on food, particularly the high sugar content that I know um, Tim Lang here at City was, was instrumental, and Corinna as well, you've been involved with labelling food for the sugar content, that, they want all that to go. They want to get rid of all the quality uh, control on, um, that we've seen on food, so these uh, <coughs> Milton Mulberry pork pies, Stilton cheese, Sancerre wine, uh, all of that has got to go to allow um, US wine and foods to come in um, that, that, and use that branding. They also want to have no discussion of climate change in the agreement at all and no bindings on greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a very, very different approach to the EU-Canada deal, which has the sustainable development chapter, and also the environment chapter with the Paris Accord um, emissions targets embedded in it. <coughs> very, very different to that, even the Australia deal. Even in the Australia framework, where all of the countries are agreeing on climate change as being an important element uh, in the food trade uh, nexus, but not within um, the US 
uh, deal. So you can see from the policy perspective, a trade policy, a food policy perspective, it's a very, very different environment that you're looking at with the US, UK than with the EU, UK. So these are what I've, I've mentioned some um, trade headwinds here that are, that also are going to be relevant when we're thinking about devising food policy. Um, and remember that every trade agreement is negotiated within the context of the World Trade Organization itself. So there are rules in the WTO that, that guide what these trade agreements look like. But we know that the WTO is struggling. Its dispute settlement mechanism is being stymied at the moment. And we're seeing a lot more violation or blatant violation of the rules, particularly in the, in the trade war between the US and China. And what we do know is there's been um, significant amounts of tariffs placed by China on the export of um, soy from the US to China, which has really hit the farmers in the US significantly. So the, the exports have gone down by 75%. So there really has been a, a huge hit. So that this war is, is, is causing a lot of problems in US agriculture. So there'd be real pressure for the US farmers to get access to new markets, and the UK is one of, of those markets. So these rules are not being used well. We often see, particularly in reports on the BBC, uh, about retaliatory tariffs, including the tariff on Scotch whisky. The Scotch whisky tariff <coughs> is actually a legitimate tariff that was put in place as part of uh, um, the US winning uh, at the WTO. So we have to be a bit careful about um, how we, we, we show, um, how we actually look at harm. The other one I want to highlight is negotiating trade agreements with experienced players like the EU and the US is extremely difficult. Negotiating trade agreements with them at the best of times, if you are an experienced player, will be hard. The UK is not an experienced player. We have wonderful people in the Department of International Trade now. We really do. There's some excellent people there. And the sort of head strategist is a former um, ambassador to the World Trade Organization. Very impressive. But we just don't have that hinterland. We don't have that expertise and we don't have that experience so we really are going in the deep end don't believe them when they say it can be negotiated the eu uk trade deal can be negotiated by the end of the year the best we can expect is a an agreement on goods um, so these are the conclusions that i that i have um, so this is essentially just that we're going to be working in a different regulatory and, in, and policy environment. We're going to be pulled by the different members of the World Trade Organization who have their own trade policy and their own standards on food. And we're going to be negotiating directly with them. So we will be pulled many ways. We don't have a clear mandate on our food policy here in the UK yet. We saw a little start to it, but we really don't have a very clear idea of what that looks like. And we certainly don't know how that's going to align with our trade policy. And until we know that, we're really going to get pulled around in these trade agreements, um, the ones that uh, we um, negotiate. The final point I just want to talk about is this fallacy that once we drop the tariffs, the import taxes, all the prices will go down. This is a fallacy. There's a report in the Telegraph saying there'll be a saving of £8.3 billion per year. That is incorrect. That only works if your tariff goes on the retail price of food. The tariff goes on the import price of the food. So I've got an example that will help you um, with this. So... If you, steak, if you have steak in a supermarket and it costs like 22 pounds a kilo because it's like amazing, it's really high quality beef. So it's 20 pound, 22 pounds a kilo in the supermarket. So if you get a 10% tariff drop, you would expect that you were actually going to save 20 pounds, right? So it's 22 two pounds a kilo. You expect that you're having a, a really significant saving if you had your if you had a 10% tariff and then then you you drop it. <coughs> now, sorry, you bring the price down to 20 pounds, so you have this wonderful saving. 
But in actual fact, the meat will have started out as a cow. Okay? And the cow will then become a carcass, and the carcass will be butchered. So the tariff goes <coughs> on the product that's imported. If that's the carcass, the carcass could actually be valued at five, um, five pounds fifty a kilo. So if your tariff comes down by 10%, the saving is 50 pence, not two quid. The supermarket is not going to pass that on to you. Yeah? Because the tariff is only on the imported goods. All the rest of the processing might happen domestically, in which case there's no other tariffs. So this figure is a fallacy. So just watch these wonderful promises. Um, they don't work that way. And I wanted to end with a note of thanks, because um, I realize we've gone over um, time. These are, the ins these are the women who've inspired me uh, in my career, and I want to spend two minutes giving thanks um, to them. So, some of them are academics I've been privileged to work with, Joanne Scott and Catherine Ridgewell. Um, so Catherine Ridgewell is the first female professor to hold the Chichill Chair of Public <coughs> International uh, Law at Oxford. She's a truly inspiring woman and somebody that was very generous and kind as well as dedicated in her work. Um, the other people uh, particularly I want to, to um, point out to you is Kim Garcia, who's a poet at Boston College Law School. And I had many happy hours with her learning how to write. So I thought I could write until I met her and realized um, what it takes to be truly creative and how to help uh, with creativity. And the other women that have inspired me are not necessarily senior to me or have been in the career longer than me. Two of the most inspirational are my colleagues, Carrie Bradshaw and my former uh, colleague, uh, Henrietta Zaffert, who's now working for the government. And it's amazing how generous uh, early career colleagues have been to me and my work, and I, I've learned from them as much as I have from the senior women uh, who've uh, guided my career. And it wouldn't be a tribute to women without a tribute to my mother, um, so I'm going to um, end with that. Thank you very much. Not in there. Um, I would encourage you to read um, uh, Fiona's work and also the Food Research Collaboration and Initiative at the Centre for Food Policy does have a lot of uh, briefing papers on Brexit at food. So if you go to the Food Research Collaboration website, you'll also find a lot of information there as well. I have to say I've got a ton of questions. It's, it takes me back to the days of, um, of when I was looking at trade more closely. But I'm not going to ask those questions. I'm going to invite uh, the audience to ask theirs. And if you have any particular comments or reflections, that they're also welcome. Yeah, there's a question here. Oh, as to the, um... Sorry, um, if you could wait for the microphone since it's been recorded. Thank you. And if you could say um, uh, who you are and, and your affiliation, if you have one. Uh, my name is Nana Edmonds. I'm a fairly recent transplant from the US, and I uh, am a sustainable food systems consultant, mostly in the US. Um, in, the, in your dire picture of um, the U.S.-U.K. Uh, uh, current political outlook of the executive branch, I'm curious, and I know very little about trade, I'm curious, um, given that the U.S.'s main piece of legislation comes out of the legislative branch, out of Congress, the, the every five-year farm bill, um, and regulates a lot of things, not the trade directly, but in many, many ways indirectly, how much, um, given that there may be changes of administration and executive, do are there... Uh, negotiating teams or relationships that are happening with the uh, often very bipartisan group of folks um, in the Senate Ag Committee uh, who are negotiating the Farm Bill, which they're working on for the whole five years until the new one uh, comes up? Or is it really only happening at that executive leadership level um, out of the President's mandates? Um, yeah, 
Uh, hi, my name is Lynn Davis from Open Food Network, and I'm interested in a previous <clears throat> in a previous incarnation of the Trade Bill. There was a call for parliamentary oversight on new trade agreements. I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. Any other questions? Okay. Down here, I think. Hi, I'm Gavin Wren, food policy communications consultant. Um, it's quite a simple one, really. I'm just like interested in your thoughts about this. What seems to be this tug of war between the EU and the US? Because it seems with such divergent opinions on what they want us to do, like what happens there? You know. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, um, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll come back. I'll, yeah, otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll collect. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Um, so the answer is I'm not close enough to the trade negotiations here in the UK to know exactly who's talking to who. It's not unusual for the domestic teams to talk. Whether they are talking, I don't know. Um, I'll have to defer to those who are, are closer to answer that question. Um, I think one of the difficulties um, in the US at the moment is the relationship between the executive and, and Congress. I think I think there is there is a challenge there. And, and certainly, I know that some of the protective measures put on the US farmers were not put through Congress, and there was a lot of dismay about that. So I think there's, the difficulty is that the, I know that the, I was privileged to speak to some people from USDA uh, at the Oxford Farming Conference, and I know that they're quite keen in terms of message and, um, and, and to actually think about getting some sort of dialing down the hysteria and actually starting to have a sensible conversation about standards. Um, and I think that that would be very welcome to have that conversation. I'm not putting any stronger than that because I know people have very, very strong views about chlorine washed chicken and hormone treated beef. But I think an open conversation about standards would be a good thing. But I, but I think it is very difficult given this current geopolitics. So that would be a um, uh, response to that. On the trade bill, um, thank you for that. Um, Parliamentary oversight is an interesting one because certainly there is a mechanism within the EU for the EU Parliament to have oversight of, the, of these of the trade negotiations, and certainly the EU mechanisms for negotiating trade agreements are, are very transparent. So you can find something I didn't talk about, but the EU's negotiating agenda and what it hopes to get out of the UK EU trade deal is there. So these are what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, these are the principles we're working with, these are the policy agenda. This is very, very transparent. We don't seem to have adopted that here. Um, one thing I would definitely argue for is more transparency in the UK in terms of what we're negotiating, um, what we're hoping to achieve. I think more transparency allows uh, civil society, academics and, um, and the press to report, to get feedback. It makes the whole process legitimate. And we are moving forward into a more democratic space, so I would expect to see more oversight of this kind to make our agreements legitimate. That would, that's a very personal view on that one. And tug of war with the EU and the, the US, yes, geopolitics is, is a necessary part of trade. I think one thing to remember is that I presented it as a US-EU fight, but it's a 164-member fight um, because we're, we're the shiny new toy. And it's like, oh, we'll have a piece of that um, because we couldn't get the EU to agree to that. But maybe the UK will. So it's a bigger fight than I portrayed. But certainly that is the environment that we're now exposed to in a way that we were insulated from it when we were a member of the European Union because uh, it was bigger and because it negotiated on our behalf. So I think it's just the reality of politics. So, So I'm Ali and I'm a economic student and I was just looking and uh, I took point of the note they were saying that the exports of America reduced by about 75%. So it's clear that 
the American food sector is in a struggle to look for a new market to enter. Now, in terms of um, discussing kind of like the policies, shouldn't it be more kind of like, rather than using our kind of like our standards, shouldn't we be the ones to tell America how we want the food standard of the food coming in? Potentially, <coughs> there might be a very good trade agreement that we can um, uh, pursue with any other country in America or any neighboring countries. But shouldn't we put the standard rather than let them basically sway us wherever they want? Hey, um, uh, <coughs> Matthew Thompson, uh, Food for Change. Um, you, in answer to the latest question, you talked about um, this kind of uh, performative democratic age now, where every reason about everything. You talked about maybe a degree of public oversight to uh, the large process of consensus building around what we want our scope to be. Say a little bit more about what the format of that might be. Obviously, Henry's rather you know, involved group of people here in a, in a quite a big process of consultation and deliberative democratic processes. That's not something I see this government wanting to um, do. Um, I'm Sarah Anderton from Siren. Um, you mentioned that the agriculture bill doesn't really cover trade. Um, do you think it should, and what do you think it should have in it? Yes, I hope I'll take the military. Um, just to answer the first one, um, so it, it's the soy exports from the US that have really been hit. Um, Really, and because of sort of size of the the, the farms there, the, the effect's been quite devastating. You're also on the dairy farmers as well, so it's been quite a devastating effect. Um, then the question is, does that make them economically vulnerable for us to say to them, you're going to be a rule taker, so you're going to take our standards? Um, I think they've probably got quite a long way to go before they reach that. Um, level just because of the we remember that agriculture and food are just one part of a big trade negotiation so there'll be other areas where there's quite a lot of strength and trade negotiations ultimately are about economic power so the larger you are um, in terms of your economic growth if you like the more clout you have the more um, and the larger the market the, the sort of general rule of thumb is that you're, you're much more likely to say, this is what. Customer, we can still walk away. Yeah, but it depends on if, if your companies want access and they want access and they want access and it's cheap because that's they want to export more. And one of the government strategies in terms of agriculture is to promote the export of the, of the UK brand. Um, so the quality brand and if you're interested in that you're interested in your export market so <coughs> then the question is what are you prepared to do to get access to that market and the other thing to factor into the mix is do you want access for financial services and if you want access for financial services are you prepared to throw agriculture and food under a bus which also happens so it depends on we, we talk about trade-offs um, yeah, so so that I, I wish that was the case, but we can always walk away, and that's certainly what Theresa Villa said uh, would be um, happening. Um, format of public engagement, in citizens' forums. I mean, certainly, like you say, the Henry Dimbleby's model of public engagement uh, is something that that's very exciting. Um, and certainly, the website, you know, come and join the conversation, put your comment here. So the idea of being part of devising food policy is very exciting. Um, the NFU has suggested something similar in terms of looking at food standards and how food quality might be embedded into um, the trade strategy uh, going forward. As far as I know, that's not, I think there's been some discussion about whether um, the government's open to that sort of strategy, but I don't know how far that's got. Um, <laughs> the, the question is, I suppose, um, just because you have a forum, how democratic is that? Who gets access? 
you know, if you're if you're up in the, if you're a hill farmer in the middle of North Yorkshire and without an internet connection, can you be part of the conversation? So, I think it's important to have an attempt, but quite what that would look like, uh, I would leave to those who who are much more experienced in this part. I, I, I guess um, I think we would also think it's important, but I guess in the way my question is saying, is there any way the government thinks it's important? I wouldn't know the answer to that question. Um, I think that's the nice thing about an academic, being an academic. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I think this is fine. Um, so going back to the trade element in the agriculture bill, at the moment um, we've got a trade and taxation bill that has a lot of the heavy lifting for trade in. And that has things like trade remedies in, which means if all of a sudden you get a massive influx of um, chicken uh, portions, um, that completely floods your market, it's very unexpected. How can you react to that influx? It's very unexpected. Well, one of the ways you can do it is you can do an investigation, you can look at what the reasons are for that flood of imports, and in response to that um, investigation, you might say, well, actually, somebody's exporting them deliberately uh, under the value, under their actual value, in which case we'll slap a tariff on it, and that's a retaliatory trade measure. So those sort of mechanisms are in the trade and taxation bill. I think one of the reasons the trade measures are not in the agriculture bill is because agriculture's devolved. So it's a question, well, how do you manage standards um, in a way that's respectful of the devolved administrations? So we're talking about food standards here, like they're homogenous for the UK, but in actual fact, because agricultural policies devolve, there is a sort of sense of, well, you know, Scotland doesn't want GM food. The UK seems to be open to GM food. So how does that square with your um, trade policy? So I think they've left it out because they just don't know what to do with this. So I think it comes in the two difficult box. Um, so... I think maybe, maybe they might put it in once they know what the standards are. Who knows? Um, yeah. Is that such? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello again, I'm, I'm Alex Moore. I'm from the UK Flower Millers Association. Um, you started off with your title, and they, so the question was, what happens to food after Brexit? So what do you think does happen? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, you can speculate. It's all right. <laughs> yes, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Esther. I uh, study nutrition at the University of Westminster. So I don't have a lot of knowledge of um, economy or tr about trade at all. But I'm just um, a fear of being. Obviously, I'm a consumer, and I'm going into my a nutrition field. Um, and I've just got the fear that if the UK US goes on to have that agreement or have a some kind of trade deal, um, that w we will lose a lot with that. And obviously, and I'm not from the UK, so I've moved in here five years ago, and now I'm really not sure about generally what will happen even in, in my future field. So what do you think, will it go through, if, if not, um, what will be the next step? As in like, will the uh, EU, UK, which one is more possible, sorry. So um, which was the, the biggest possibility of happening, US, UK or, or EU? Okay. Hi, my name's John, a former food policy student here in Sydney. Um, I'm wondering about the consequences of the sort of deal that you're talking about with the US, which is something which is liberalizing, essentially prizing open the market for access. Um, I would presume that over time, the competitive pressure that's generated by the import of goods from a market like the US is going to just inevitably generate um, domestic pressure from domestic producers in the UK for uh, essentially softening of standards as a consequence of the, you know, just the economics of how that's going to work out. I know we've had all of these statements from the government around commitment to standards and quality and you know, the, the brand of, of Buy British, but in the circumstances of the last few years, 
how much trust do we really have that, that those sort of assurances are going to be meaningful when the real economic pressure of, of these things, let's say five, ten years down the line, is starting to bite on domestic producers? Um, I think question one and question two are probably sort of getting at the same thing. What's going to happen to food? Um, gosh, after Brexit. Gosh, if I knew, you know, if I knew the answer to that question, this would be great, wouldn't it? And, uh, and that would be um, that would be very wonderful. I think. Um, let me let me sort of answer the question a little bit roundabout, but I think I'll get there. Um, the regulatory environment that we're entering is the World Trade Organization environment. So basically, we're setting our own standards, and then we're working within the context of the, the WTO. So the WTO doesn't prescribe standards. So we are very much on our own. All WTO says is that if you are going to have standards, and you are going to use labels, and you are going to use trade measures to achieve certain objectives, they have to be done on a non-discriminatory basis. And there's lots of rules about what that looks like. So then we come back into um, the, the law won't save us um, here. So it's really a question of what do we want going forward there, because there will be geopolitical pressures we are being pulled at the moment, because we're the, we are the fifth largest economy, or we were. Um, we are significant in terms of trade. We're historically important in terms of trade markets, even from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we're an important market, so there's good quality food coming in as well as we're not just going to get swamped. Um, so, and we are eating a, a lot of food from all over the world already, including the US. Um, so I think it's, I think in terms of what will happen to food, I don't think we'll get swamped, even if, even with trade deals. I would hope that we'll have some sort of labelling system in place for the food we buy in the supermarkets. Um, it will be a lot more difficult in, in terms of restaurants and catering to have that in place. The thing to remember with negotiating positions as well is you always hear the loud symbols at the beginning, like this is my absolute extreme position. Um, you, you will have chlorine rush chicken, you will take our standards, you will be a satellite of the EU or the US or Australia or wherever. And yet as we move forward, um, the geopolitical reality will set in because the trade negotiators will do the negotiating. There'll be lots of political rhetoric and then they'll meet somewhere in the middle. So I don't think we should be afraid, but I think it's an opportunity to really think about what we want and think about it in the context of trade. Um, yeah, farmers markets, for example. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I think that's sort of answered, I think, the two together. And interesting about domestic pressures, asking me about, oh, about domestic pressures, will it lead to softening um, anyway? Um, maybe over time, I think it depends on the sort of products, maybe some, maybe climate change is going to have a, 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 a quite significant downward pressure, um, mainly because we may not be able to get foods from certain markets historically we could get them from because they just can't be grown there anymore. So there'll be pressure on resources. It may well be that markets we, we previously didn't want to get things from, we move over to get things from, depends obviously if certain products can't be grown in certain places. So I think climate change will change um, the landscape as well as um, the domestic pressures. So yeah, inevitably we will see a change over time. And if, I mean, if you like, Brexit is an example of domestic pressure for change. Um, so as is Trump in the US. So it, it's inevitable, I think. It's not, it's not a stomach picture. Okay, well thanks for those uh, fascinating uh, comments. Um, I uh, the next Food Thinkers, uh, Women's Food Thinkers, we are hoping will be on March the 11th uh, with Bahaway Sarvi and with Barbara Bay to talk about 
um, food um, business, progressive food business. And I'd also like to say that if you're interested in learning anything more about the Centre for Food Policy and our work, we, uh, we do have an annual report that was just um, put online about an hour ago. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in that, please do, uh, please do uh, check that out, as well as our Food Research Collaboration Brexit, brief, Brexit Briefs, as I, um, as I mentioned. Uh, so, on to um, food and Brexit. We deliberately pro provocative title about what would happen to food in the wake of Brexit. And uh, what I think we've learned from one of the countries without question leading ex experts on the matter, uh, who knows more about what will happen to policy and international trade rules than anybody else, is that there are some certainties, but there's also a lot of feeling our way forward in terms of actually what's going to happen to policy um, and law, and actually what's probably going to happen to food, we don't really know at this point. Uh, I was struck by that, I was travelling abroad last week, and I deliberately went through the EU channel to see if anybody was going to say, you're not a member of the EU anymore, you're not allowed to this channel. Nobody noticed. <laughs> so, I, um, I, I, I think I was indicated that it was just, it's just too early to really fully understand what these, these changes are going to be, but at least we have experts like Fiona who are really keeping track of the policy changes uh, that are happening and really analysing, stepping back and analysing um, what is really going to go on and the implications at least for the food system. So thanks very much um, for that expert view. Um, I certainly now feel so much more fully informed. So thank you very much. Uh, and, uh,